So uh, please help me welcoming Marco Shea, who's, who's the author of this lovely book. Marco. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon. I'm really happy to be here and I'm excited to talk to you about some of the stories in my book, as well as explaining a bit about what compelled me to write it. I'm coming to you today from up the valley in Greenfield, Massachusetts. Dairy or London Dairy, as it's also known, um, Northern Ireland is the subject of my talk today. And I've spent a lot of time in dairy over the years, beginning in 1998, 1999, 2004, 2007, 2008, 2014, um, even a, a quick visit last summer. We'll start with just a little bit of music. And if any of you are familiar with dairy, you will be familiar with this tune. Before I went to Derry for the first time in 1998, I had spent much of my life to that point in industrial cities that had struggled in one way or another to come to terms with the post-industrial world that we lived in. I was raised in Meriden, Connecticut, which you see here, and I had studied in Philadelphia. Meriden, I think, is a lot like Holyoke. It's a similar size and it saw similar patterns of immigration and migration. And it's a proudly working class city. It has a strong heritage with Irish, Polish, French and Puerto Rican Catholics shaping its neighborhoods, building church communities and schools. Um, between the 1950s and the 1980s, we saw a lot of the factories leave Meriden. Um, Whoops. Uh, and it left an economy that has never really quite recovered. And we see that in a downtown that has struggled to re retain its vitality and about 40% of adults traveling to nearby cities, not that far, like people might work in Holyoke or Chicopee or Springfield and Chicopee. Um, but when I arrived in Derry, Despite the history that I had learned about civil conflict and violence, especially during the period between 1969 and 1998, which is known generally as the Troubles, uh, Derry felt really familiar to me. During that first visit, I lived there for just over a year. And as I settled in, it struck me over and over in so many different ways how Derry of the 1990s seemed so much like the Meriden of the 1950s and 60s, the Meriden that my parents had grown up in and had become young adults in, the Meriden that lived in their memories um, and in mine because they shared the stories. Um. So how, you ask? Um, well, life seemed condensed. Wait, hold on a second. I lose you guys. We're going to share again. Technical difficulties on Zoom. Yay. You know, it's a real event and not a pre recorded one when the images disappear on us. There we go. All right. So I think I might have been trying to be dramatic, you guys, and had that like black screen. Oh, dear, dear, dear me. I won't try to do that again. All right. So how did Derry seem like the Meriden or even possibly the Holyoke um, of an earlier generation? 
first of all, life seemed really condensed and filled with people. People didn't move away. Extended families lived close to each other, and people were forever popping in and out of each other's homes. They were standing on the stoop for a chat. Families made the point of gathering for Sunday dinners. If I went up the town, as they say in Derry, to do some errands, it seemed like I ran into everybody that I knew. If I bought flowers in a shop in September, the next time I walked in there, and it could be a couple months later, the shopkeeper would say, Ah, oh, Margo, how are you keeping? And what do you hear from America these days? You could seriously spend an hour in the supermarket catching up with people. Um, so this was so much like the Meriden that my parents talked about, um, the world that they grew up in. But by the time I was growing up, um, people had moved further away from the urban core. Oftentimes people went to college and they didn't move back to Meriden. Um, cars meant that nobody shopped or ran errands downtown so much. Um, but still, there were these memories in my family that really felt like the dairy that I came to know in 1998. And one story I always remember is one that my dad tells. Um, when he was a very young mayor of Meriden, he was 32 when he was elected, um, he, uh, his first snowstorm, which occurred really soon after his inauguration, my dad ordered um, Main Street be closed so that kids could go sledding down it. Um, and he never forgot the chief of the fire department basically barging down his office door here in City Hall, telling him that he had to open the streets again. Um, so I had read a lot of books about dairy, books with titles like Countdown to Disaster, and those were real bullets, and The Road to Bloody Sunday. Um, and they were filled with kind of images like the one you see on your screen. But the city that I discovered um, as the troubles came to an end in 1998 seemed so very, very different from the apocalyptic burning place that I had seen so often um, in images and I had read about in books. So I found myself fascinated by dairy, by its history, by the sense of community that I found everywhere on both sides of the sectarian divide, Protestant, Catholic, not so much between the sides, mind you, um, but even that has changed a lot in the past 20 years. Um, what I noticed was that community was not an abstract thing, it was lived. Everyone was in and out of each other's pockets, as they would say. I remember soon after I arrived in Derry, um, the Nobel laureate poet Seamus Heaney came to the local library to give a reading. Um, everybody was packed in and I will never forget people like local historian Mickey McGinnis from the Cragen, um, who is now passed on, sitting there in the front row with this huge smile on his face, just like the one you see in this picture. And he's like leaning forward in his chair and he's calling out requests, right? I mean, can you imagine being in a room today and people know the, the oeuvre, the collection of a poet so well that they can literally call out requests for the poems. Um, but, you know, here he was and he was saying, ah, Seamus, please, will you, will, you, will you give us the one about your mammy, the ones about the potatoes? And Seamus Heaney's standing up there and he's like, ah, Mickey, will you never tire of that old poem? Um, let's have a listen. It's worth it. And this is a recording um, of the poet himself. When all the others were away at mass, I was all hers as we peeled potatoes. They broke the silence, let fall one by one, like soldier weeping off the soldiering iron. A cold comfort set between us, things to share, gleaming in a bucket of clean water. And again, fall. As though pleasant snatches from each other's work would bring us to our senses. So when the parish priest at her bedside went hammering tongs at the prayers for the dying, and some were responding, and some crying, I remembered her head bent towards my head, her breath in mine, our flint dipping knives. Never closer 
whole rest of our lives. I think that night sticks with me so much, even over 20 years later, um, because it really felt to me like the past was present. The past lived in the poems. The past also lived in the banter between the poet and the audience. And I learned really quickly in Derry that the past was everywhere. It was woven into daily life. It wasn't something that was separated. It wasn't something relegated to the textbooks or the PBS documentary, right? It was, everybody was Ken Burns. Everybody had a sense of the past and a sense of story about the past. Um, and as I kind of became interested in Derry's history and in this sense of history, I realized that the past and the present mingled and couldn't be separated. Um, here's an example of that, and I'm going to read to you just a little bit. It's actually the first couple of paragraphs from my book. Barry McMonagall was 24 years old and an aspiring amateur photographer when the civil rights movement got underway in Derry, Northern Ireland in the late 1960s. Looking back on his experiences documenting the movement and the outbreak of the troubles, he said, what a heady sense of change there was in the trembling Derry air. What a tumult of ideas and bright seeming glimpses of a different future beckoning. What was said then was everything's changed. Nothing will ever be the same again. And to try to explain this sense of rupture, McMonagall recounted Derry Catholic's sense that something had shifted in the city's political culture after decades of stalemate, after partition. A space open and all of these pent up frustrations at city authorities whose policies had marginalized the political voices of the Catholic majority of the city. So in August 1969, there was a battle in the streets and you see some images of it in front of you between the Catholic and nationalist um, community and the, the police who were known as the Royal Ulster Constabulary or the RUC and the B Specials um, who were a, a kind of um, volunteer police force that uh, were weaponized and kind of had full reign. Um, so Barry McMonagall says, there's a story, it's probably made up, but it's possibly true. How more, like how more Irish can you get, right? It's probably made up, but it's possibly true of a 10 year old girl hurling a stone down Rossville street at the police and shouting, I've waited 50 years for this. Everyone will have known what she meant. Um, well, if you're an American, uh, if you're not familiar with Derry, you might be forgiven for really not having a clue what she meant. How does a 10 year old sort of, you know, hold on to 50 years of frustration and how does it burst in this moment in 1969? So what did she mean? Or maybe I guess a better question could be, what were the lived experiences of Catholics in Derry? Um, and why would this little girl be holding on to a memory of something she had literally never experienced? What was up with that? Um, and, and just by looking at this slide, you immediately get a sense that something is up, right? First, you see the city has two names. It's Derry and it's Londonderry. Some people um, will say that the city was founded in the sixth century, in 570. Um, but others will say that the city was founded in the 17th century. That's a whole lot of time, right? Over a thousand years um, as a plantation city. Um, the, the major event in a Protestant Unionist calendar would be the Siege of Derry, um, when the city 
was held by um, a small number of young men who were loyal to Cromwell's parliamentarians. Um, and they were being besieged by royalists who were supporters of the Catholic King James. Right, and so if you've ever heard of Derry called the Maiden City, which you might at some point, it's because the city um, built these walls to protect itself from these Catholic, um, this Catholic army that was coming and they feared that the, the Catholic army was coming to take away everything they knew. And because this was part of a period in English history where Catholicism and Protestantism were battling over um, lots of things that had nothing to do with theology or God, there was this sense that holding on um, to the maiden city was holding on to the very fiber of identity, political identity, cultural identity, and also religious identity. Um, keeps flipping on me. So the city has two names, as I just explained to you. It has two different origin stories. One of that sixth century Irish monastic settlement and the name Derry, which actually is Gaelic for Oak Grove. The other, Londonderry, honoring the granting of a city charter in 1613. Um, England's king had suggested or possibly demanded um, that London's trade companies invest in plantation in Ireland. And so in order to celebrate and express gratitude for the livery companies, which are quite kind of like stables, I mean, liveries would have been um, the, the, the folks who transported people and goods in the days when most transportation took place by horses. So the City of London's Court of Common Council formed this joint stock company to finance the plantation of Ulster. And when the money went to Derry, the city got a name change as a result of it. Um, so the names of the city were different for Protestants and Catholics. The dates were different. The victories for one were the losses for the other. Folklorist Henry Glassy reflected on this when he said, in the context of Northern Ireland, the presence of the past is not so much a divided narrative as much as it is at least two separate ones. Protestants and Catholics begin at different points. They follow different routes. They embrace different personalities. History is not so much a weapon between the groups as it is a means to consolidate each group. And on top of this, Protestants and Catholics alike have experienced historic sensibilities of being both marginalized and vulnerable. And what I mean by that is that Protestants who had come to Ireland as part of the plantation enterprise that started in the 16th century um, felt marginalized because they were a minority population on the island of Ireland. Irish Catholics who were considered to be the native population um, were a vast majority. But in Ulster, these nine counties in the northeast, little bit of northwest of Ireland, um, Protestants were a majority and Catholics were a minority. And so when Ireland separate, when Northern Ireland separated from the rest of Ireland, um, Catholics felt marginalized and vulnerable in the north. So you have this population of people where everyone sort of feels victimized and everyone um, is claiming a history and projecting their memories of the past in order to kind of cement and, um, and hold up the, the present. Um, this is one thing to sort of think about, you know, in an academic way. It's one thing when an American historian 
talks about this, but I remember really clearly being at the, um, the archives, the big major archives in Belfast, um, the public records office of Northern Ireland. And I came across this interview that had been done with Bishop Neil Farron, who was the, the, the leading religious figure in Derry when the troubles broke out in 1969. And as the leading Catholic religious figure, he was also a really important political leader and cultural leader. Let's see if I have this. Not sure. No. Okay. Um, so there was a huge pro, um, protest that turned violent in Derry um, at the end of 1968. And immediately afterwards, a commission, the Cameron Commission, was founded to investigate the violence of October 5th, 1968. It's often referred to as the Duke Street March. And so Neil Farron, the bishop, because he was such an important person, was obviously called upon um, to talk about what he thought had spurred um, this march, which had turned into something that looked a lot like a riot. And all of us have been watching our TVs, right? And we've seen um, scenes of, of unrest, sometimes unrest that has turned violent in our own country over the past few months. And so um, when Neil Farron was asked about this, he didn't begin in 1968. He didn't even begin in 1921 with the partition of Ireland or 1801, which was the act of union binding um, Ireland with the United Kingdom. His response to this question, what happened and how did it start on Duke Street in 1968, was tied to the memory of an Irish and Catholic dairy essentially standing right alongside maybe a little bit invisible to the outsider, um, alongside the city that was planned and planted in the early 1600s as part of the English colonial project. Um, and so this is what he said. Derry was founded in 548 by St. Columba and his monks. Londonderry was established a thousand years later by a royal charter of King James. Although these events may only be history, the problems they created are what perplex the city today. The principal task entrusted with the Irish society in 1612 was, I quote, the removal of the natives and the planting wholly with British people. And there it was, plain as day watching and reading as Neil Farron sort of talked about these radically different memories, these radically different interpretations of the past being cast or mapped onto precisely exactly the same physical space. It just blew me away. And it also was very clear to me, um, as someone who had lived in Derry, as someone who studied the city, that those histories weren't equal. Um, you're all certainly familiar with the idea that the history gets written by the winners, right? The, 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 the victors usually have a louder voice. Um, and the interpretations of the past are often created out of the sorts of primary sources and records that have been left behind by those who ultimately won whatever the contest was. So despite the fact that Derry had been a majority Catholic city since 1850, power had been held by Protestant Unionists. Um, and so the city projected a very Protestant and Unionist past onto the city, not just in Derry, in all of Northern Ireland, but Derry was really the only um, major town or city that had a majority Catholic population. And that's what made it sort of such an oddity, right? That it would have this majority population that somehow, because of political actions because of um, economic situations, didn't have a, a political voice and couldn't project its message, um, just became interwoven into the history. Um, this, this slide I think has gotten a little bit funky, so I apologize. 
But you can see here the walls of the city. Um, they are a mile of contiguous wall. They sit on top of a hill, and these were the walls that were created in the 1600s to sort of protect the inner part of the city against sieges from the Catholic Royalist armies, right? Um, so for Protestant Unionists, remembrance was woven into not just the official histories, but it was also woven into the urban landscape itself, the physical landscape. And memory was a very public process, and these kind of div divides or wars over memory were accompanied by pageantry, by ritual, um, the, the, and those things, they do more than just kind of, you know, um, remember or take note of the things that happened in the past. They're also really present, right? They, they affirm like the reality of the present by making particular kinds of references to the past. Um, and a, a really good example, I think, are the commemorations and the celebrations um, that, have, that are accompanying these walls themselves. Believe it or not, it was actually in the 1700s that Protestant Unionists in Derry started to commemorate the events that they saw as so pivotal, not just to their survival, but to their political power and primacy in Derry and in Northern Ireland. And they had these annual commemorations um, where Unionist Protestants would march the wall around the walls. Um, and there was like folklore, uh, hard in some cases to corroborate with um, evidence that historians might consider to be um, useful or valuable. But if you look at these walls, here you see this beautiful green sort of hillscape. Um, th that was all housing until the 1960s. And when you look to the left, well, it's the left on my screen, it should be the left on your screen of this image, um, you're looking at the bog side. And the bog side is famous. Um, certainly as the site of Bloody Sunday. The bog side is famous as the Catholic and nationalist neighborhood of Derry. Um, and the bog side had been the primary and for a very long time, the only neighborhood where Catholics were, um, were allowed to live because of segregation that was both um, de jure and de facto is the language that we would use by law and also um, by custom. So for me, I was really struck by both the combination of and the presence, I was struck by the combination of both the presence of community, um, but this harder to see or tease out, but the ever present sense of the past for Catholics in Derry that in so many ways seemed to be really hard to find in the more formal memorial um, structures of the city and the more formal um, memorial narratives. For people like me who study the presence of the past, we're always looking for particular things, right? Statues, monuments, street names. Um, and I just found myself sort of puzzled um, by the, 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 the constantness of the past with the, the difficulty in trying to find it in the cityscape. Um, so what you see before you is called St. Columns Well. Um, and as I've talked about a little earlier in this talk, St. Colum or St. Columba was the monk who is said to have founded the city in the sixth century. Um, he was very much in love with Derry, and Derry people will always sort of quote um, this prayer that is attributed to St. Columba, um, where on his deathbed, he said that he wished that he could go back to his little Derry, his little oak grove. So is, there's this sense that St. Columba really loved this city and loved this place. Um, what's interesting to me is that this well is still there today, right? So the well was um, initially 
I mean, it dates back to any records I could find. So at least as early as the 1850s, there is talk of a holy well, a blessed well, a, a, a well whose water has curative powers, right? And next to the well, it was said that there was a stone and that stone had these two holes kind of worn into it that were exactly the shape of knees, right? Um, and so the, this stone is fascinating because it is said um, that the, the kneeling stone of St. Columba was the only holy relic that was left when the great church of that early monastery, the Temple Moor, was destroyed um, during the early years of English plantation. And in fact, Catholic lore in Derry will have it that when plantation got underway, the church, the Temple Moor, was demolished so that the stones themselves could be used to build the walls of the city. So there's this, this kind of in, this intense um, connection between these histories, but that connection is a troubled one. Um, and even from these early, early stories is a somewhat violent one. Um, so in a lot of ways, my research started here. It started with hearing the stories of the kneeling stone that was attributed to Columba um, and hearing that it had been located right by this well. Um, as I dug deeper into this, I found out about a local priest. His name was Father Willie, uh, Father Willie Doherty. And of course, all the formal records, you know, talked about Father William Doherty. And I remember when I first started talking to people and doing some interviews, um, I met with this man, uh, Tommy Riley, and he, he just corrected me immediately. He was like, oh, you're talking about Father Willie. Yeah, my mother and father were friends with Father Willie. And I'm like, this guy was a priest in 1897. How can you like, how can this still be a living memory? But that's just another example of this kind of, this presence of the past. Um, so Father Willie had secured this relic, this kneeling stone, um, and he had overseen it as it sat in the middle of the road. Um, but by the 1890s, there was a sense that the kneeling stone itself and maybe the well were kind of inconvenient. Um, there was also a sense that the Protestant Unionists of the city um, might have kind of objected to what they thought of as this really Catholic kind of um, symbolism, right, with their saints and their healing wells and their kneeling stones. It really was counter to a Protestant um, experience of lived faith, right? Lived faith in that experience is more personal, it's individual, it's not out in a public space, it's not figurative and representative and symbolic, it's much more about one's relationship with the Word of God in the Bible. Um, so there's also kind of a sense in the historical record um, that this well and this kneeling stone um, were sort of a problem, right? And so um, Father Willie decided to do two things. He wanted to move the stone, but he also wanted to create a tradition. He invented a holiday. It's June 9th. And to this day in Derry, it's June 9th is celebrated as St. Columba's Day. And literally, Father Willie like made up the holiday. Um, it corresponded with the 1300th anniversary of the death of St. Columba. Um, but he essentially gathered um, people around and got them excited about celebrating the saint. Um, and they did. They um, created these huge arches with decorations and flowers. Um, they lit up the bog side with tiny little sparkling lights. They adorned this well um, with like images that related to prayers as well as Irish history. Um, and at midnight, 
on the evening of June 9th, there was this ceremony and Father Willie had kind of orchestrated it, but people really bought in. The Catholic community of Derry were all in. And the records suggest that as many as 5,000 people showed up at midnight um, on this evening to take this kneeling stone and in a solemn, silent procession to carry it. And the thing was huge. Um, and weighed a lot. It took 12 men to carry that up a very steep hill. You got a sense of the hill, right? From the last slide I showed you of the, the hillscape leading up to the walls, the Long Tower Church, the Catholic Church was just on the outside of the walls, but up at the top of that hill. And they carried that kneeling stone and they um, made it part of an outdoor Calvary scene. Um, and it's still there, right? So um, that memory, that history kind of remained um, and, and still remains as part of Catholic Dairy's story and as part of its memory. Um, so this was just one example, a relatively early example, right? For me, 1897, um, but it tied into this kind of realization that without access to political power, and with little in the way of financial resources and without the ability to kind of project their historical um, consciousness in any formal way um, onto the city or the, um, the province, memory became this way of crafting an alternative history. And memory, therefore, enabled Derry's residents not just to resist the status quo where they were marginalized and seen as less than, um, but also to take confident steps towards the future. And so I'm just going to look at the time. There we go. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about how Derry Catholics used memory um, to build community and to try to um, sort of position relationships with one another and relationships among the Catholic nationalist population as a kind of power. And so um, one of the ways they would do this obviously is through stories, right? And dairy people, um, oftentimes, you know, found entertainment through singing, through playing musical instruments, through gathering on people's stoops, um, and through telling stories. And dairy people were really, really famous for their ghost stories. They loved to tell each other ghost stories. And what I found as I started to think about memory um, is that ghost stories had this incredible power to embed within them the values and the messages that the community found important and meaningful. Um, so I'm going to tell you one of the most famous ghost stories, one that's um, still told in Derry today, um, and it's called The Devil and the Long Tower Gamblers. So there used to be a farm at the top of Howard Street, just outside the city walls. And it was owned by a man named Milligan. It burned down in the early years of the, the 1900s, but some of the outbuildings remained on the site. One of them was used as a blacksmith's forge. Men who lived in Bishop Street and other lanes in the Long Tower area used to meet there at night to play cards. Men were conscious of their financial kind of scarcity, so they would really only bet a little bit. Right, they bet, you know, a couple pence. So one night, one of the regular card players met a stranger at a local pub. The man said that he was interested in playing cards. So the dairy man extended an invitation to their regular game at the forge. No one was happy when he showed up with a stranger. It's just not done. However, this fellow started to bet and he started to lose. And then he started to bet bigger and he started to lose more. 
after a really long losing streak, the stranger began to win. As the story went, the stakes got higher and higher and the gambling men got more and more desperate and they were like totally backing beyond their means. They were betting their wages and they were going home with no money. So one guy commented sort of like jokingly that he would sell his soul to best the stranger. And the stranger laughed and banged the table. At that moment, the man who was dealing dropped the cards and the table was jostled, right? So when he glanced down to pick up the cards under the table, he saw that instead of feet, the stranger actually had cloven hooves. He jumped up from the table, immediately threw his chair back and started running, telling his mates to run. But that guy who had joked about selling his stole was, soul was frozen on the spot. He seemed to be totally stuck. Two others went back and they tried to yank him away, but the stranger held onto him tightly. All the men returned and together they pulled their friend free. They all ran down the wells and that the wells is actually the street you're looking at right here, named of course, because of St. Columns Well. They were, they only stopped when they got here to the well and they blessed themselves with the holy water. They were terrified and really, really exhausted. As the story goes, in the glow from the gaslight, they could make out fingers burnt like a brand into the arm of the man who had been pulled away. Those fingers never, ever, ever faded. As these men blessed themselves, they saw flames up at the forge start licking into the night sky. The next day, only ashes remained of the old forge building. It had gone up in flames on that fateful night. So I find this story really powerful. I mean, it's a great story and it's so like you can totally imagine it, but it does a lot of things and it holds in the folds of the story a lot of truths about dairy Catholics experiences um, in the 1920s, 1930s going forward. It reflected the stark financial realities of dairy men. Um, it reminded people that gambling might begin as a kind of innocent diversion among friends, but it could become something way more unsettling very quickly. Um, it underscored that strangers shouldn't be trusted, even as it highlighted the necessity of friends to protect and rescue one another. Community was paramount. After all, it took the strength of all the men to rescue the one whose soul was on the line. In a pinch, the members of community, the members of this community could be relied on to do the right thing, even if individuals couldn't. And the devil might present himself in many guises, but the story illustrated the steadfast and assured presence of God and the ringing power of faith. The Long Tower men ran without stopping till they reached St. Columns Well. And here, under the protection of their patron saint, they blessed themselves and destroyed the devil's hold on them. Um, so in the absence of things like memorials and monuments and street names, you end up with songs and stories um, and, and lessons. And what I found as I continued to do this research um, is that these themes kind of kept coming back over and over and over again. Um, when I was, I found this collection of oral histories, and they're not actually in my book because they begin in this period um, that really kind of corresponds with the troubles, and my book ends um, in 1969. Um, but when people talked about these neighborhoods of Catholic dairy, this, these neighborhoods of the bog side, um, which was a neighborhood that sort of 
got larger and larger and larger in population density, even as its physical space stayed the same. And this was because it was through maintaining all Catholic nationalist residents in one voting district that Protestant Unionists were able to maintain their electoral and their political dominance and advantage in the city. And so because it was like a, um, a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? The Protestant Unionists were the um, municipal leaders. They sent all the representatives to Parliament in Stormont, later Westminster. Um, and so they made the laws and then they were able to kind of continue to shape the political pie so that the largest political piece went to the group that had a much smaller um, demographic kind of proportion, right? And so um, you had to kind of maintain this ward, it was sometimes known as the West Ward, sometimes known as the South Ward, even as the Catholic population just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So this neighborhood kind of kept getting more and more and more dense. And the housing sort of kept getting like harder and harder and harder um, to balance with the, the people's needs. It was, it was dilapidated, it was decrepit, and it was overcrowded. Um, but whenever Catholics sort of tried to move to other parts of the city, they found themselves um, kind of confronting a variety of different obstacles. And as a result, um, in 1968, when the civil rights movement really exploded in Derry, um, the Bogside neighborhood of Derry City was the most densely populated area in Western Europe. Um, and, and that's really just to make sure that even though um, they were at that point over 65% of the city's population, that they would return only 25 to 30% of the, of the political representatives to the city and to the province. Um, so I just wanna just end by talking um, a little bit by quoting a few dairy uh, residents of the Bogside during this period, right before the troubles, um, where they reflected on community. And I think that it's gonna ring true um, for folks that have lived or grown up in a close knit community. And it might sound sort of like nostalgia. You know, those were the good old days where people really looked out for each other. Um, but what I want to suggest is that when the civil rights movement and the troubles got underway in Derry, they were actually drawing on the sense of the past and the sense of community that was woven into so many different aspects of life, even if it was kind of under the radar of the official narrative. So this is Terry Doherty. And he wanted to talk about the way that people brought community into being. He said, people who had any sort of talent could play an instrument or sing a song or tell a story. These people gave their services. There was a terrific sense of community about the whole thing. It wasn't the community spirit you have now that's manufactured by social workers. It was a spirit that people, people that had a desire to look after each other. In the community, there evolved a system, and I don't think it's been equaled since. And in that system, people helped each other, they guided each other, and they also entertained each other. He said that poverty, understood to be related to political and social marginalization, was everybody's common foe. And the battle against poverty was not just about money, it was a battle against despair. It was a battle against isolation. And it was a battle against fear that often accompanies persistent financial insecurity. So as a result, it was understood that everybody would throw everything they had towards that battle. We had people, this is Terry, we had people that washed the beds and people that wrote letters and people that gave advice. The thing about it is, these people didn't set themselves up in offices. They were appointed to the position. The situation evolved over the years where people cared. And if they had a particular talent, they made themselves available to others who maybe were less articulate, 
or less fortunate or couldn't write or read. Money and entertainment were scarce and people had a common foe to face and that's how they faced it. So I sort of end on that note thinking about the ways that the past wasn't something to kind of look back on. The past was something to live with and to live through. And I'm not saying that people couldn't escape it because certainly they did and certainly they have. And Derry's not even the same place now as it was when I found it in 1998. But memory, as it was experienced, as it was performed, as it was told, became this kind of constant melody. Maybe you didn't hear the words perfectly clearly, but it was a song. And that song reminded people of who they were and it also encouraged them when the time came in the 1960s um, to ask for more and to do that together. And so my book, you know, sort of makes this argument that the troubles in Northern Ireland when they broke out in Derry, even though it really was a big, big kind of rupture and, and in a lot of ways a catastrophe, this community of kind of getting out there and marching and holding sit-ins and even getting into battles with the police and the volunteer constabulary, the B specials, was just as much a part of that community's memory and history as it was a departure from it. Thank you. That was great, Margot. Um, we're going to stop sharing for a minute. And before we get to the question and answers, before we lose everybody, Brianna is going to launch the poll that we forgot to do at the beginning. So um, Brianna, why don't you do that? And while you're answering the questions, uh, you can think about questions that you'll have for Margo. And you can either raise your hand or uh, type them up in the, the uh, chat box and we'll, we'll feed them to her. Yeah, and so the questions are going to seem a little bit strange, but they are just um, demographic surveys that are a condition of our grant funding. So it is a little bit just, oops. I'm oh, sorry. I did was somebody trying. end it? I think it's back. All right, it's back. So we lost one person. So I'm so sorry. So if you voted the first time, you just have to vote again. I'm so sorry. It looks like somebody just clicked end by accident. Great, so I'm just gonna, I'll give you guys a couple minutes to get those answers in. I don't wanna rush you because I've definitely been in, in Zoom webinars where they give you about 10 seconds to answer them and it's very overwhelming. So um, we can chat a little bit while you're still voting because I I'm only got about half of you so far. Um, All right, so yeah, so if you guys remember, um, you can feel free to put your questions in the chat on the on the right hand side. Um, but you're also welcome to take yourself off mute um, and to um, have a question when you somebody asks when I click submit nothing happens totally fine. I'm getting all the results. Um, you're not going to get any of the results. They're anonymous. All right. And Margo, I have a question while we're, we're doing this that maybe you can answer. So is there a group or um, a community organization that maintains St. Columns uh, well? You know, it's such a great question. Um, there's, to, to date, there's St. Columns well, and there's also um, this grotto, you know, sort of a, a grotto to Mary. Um, that have been maintained by two families. And essentially every generation of the family just picks up the responsibility. And I really do wonder if that's gonna continue or if there will have to be at some point a sort of professionalization of these kinds of like memory keeping and past keeping responsibilities. It's always struck me as really so different 
from our experiences where we do have um, organizations that take on the responsibility to preserve, to maintain, um, to make sure things don't get um, vandalized, right? So, um, but to date, it's really still a, a private kind of enterprise or project. Um, is there anybody who's still taking the poll? I just want to make sure um, before I end it um, that everyone who started taking the poll has completed it or if you need a little bit more time, just unmute yourself and let me know right now. Or wave your hand. It looks like you're all good. So I am going to go ahead and, and end the poll, okay? Um, if you weren't able to fill it out, you can send me an email afterwards. So does anyone have any other further questions for um, Margo? I'm busy sitting here texting my husband who actually is on the Zoom call, um, kind of <laughs> asking him what he thought about it. <laughs> Welcome to the 21st century. <laughs> I have a quick question. Hi, Margo. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're t you, you kind of closed with talking about um, how these stories kind of shape identities, um, but we still have effectively two separate stories. And so how does the validity, like how this is, probably out of the scope of kind of what you were doing, but how do you determine validity of somebody's story when that person's story of kind of their identity and their being is clashing in so many different ways with somebody else's? Yeah, I, I mean, that's an awesome question. And it's one that we're certainly uh, living with in the moment, I think, in this cultural moment in the United States. Um, but I actually, I mean, I, I'm going to say a couple of things. I'm going to start by saying, because that's so sticky, and because that's so complicated, um, there have been, on the one hand, um, a real push to sort of create one shared narrative of Northern Ireland. And since the peace, um, since the peace process, that's really been this kind of um, a push to say memory has been divisive for so long, right? Let's cut, let's focus on the things we have in common. Let's focus on sort of crafting a narrative that we can share. Um, and that's kind of like hasn't happened because of all the reasons I mentioned. At the, on the other hand, um, there are groups like Towards Understanding and Healing and Healing Through Storytelling and a bunch of, um, organizations like that that have popped up in Northern Ireland um, and they've really concentrated on creating um, safe and non-threatening spaces where people who have been largely impacted by the troubles, um, maybe not so much earlier, but certainly their life stories were impacted by the kinds of things I talked about today, um, where they can come together and, and listen right, where everyone has the opportunity to tell their story and to be heard. And the rules of engagement, the, the processes are very, very strictly um, sort of organized, right? You can't interrupt, you can't argue someone's reality, you can't tell them that that's not what happened. And so when I, I had the opportunity to attend some of these retreats, and you have British soldiers who've been stationed in Northern Ireland, you have members of the IRA, you have family members of mem you know, the police, of the Republican movement, of Protestant paramilitaries, and they're all together in a room and they're listening to one another's stories and they are entering into each other's stories. They're entering into each other's memories. It doesn't mean that they come out of that experience agreeing with each other's kinds of pers perspectives or perceptions of the past, um, but it does open up space 
for a kind of reckoning with the difference. I will say that one of the most interesting kind of moments I ever experienced at one of those retreats um, was when two men, one Protestant and one Catholic, who were exactly the same age, um, told, like one told the story about a bombing in Derry. Um, and the other one said, oh, I was there. I remember that bombing. This is what I remember. So it wasn't confrontational, but what they remembered about the exact same moment, the exact same bombing were radically different. Their perspectives, which were built upon so many kinds of points in a constellation of identity, brought them to see that historical moment of that bomb in radically different ways. And I think that um, while it may be simpler to say, let's sort of, you know, they often say like, um, let's kind of put a carpet over the past and just move forward. I think some of the work that has been done that actually makes, brings all of this out into fresh air and invites people to sort of puzzle with each other about it um, has been helpful. And at the same time, I mean, Northern Ireland has done amazing stuff with memory work. Um, another thing that I think is really interesting, um, if any of you guys have heard of Burning Man, there's this guy at Burning Man, he's, a, he's an artist. Burning Man is this kind of city that gets built um, and destroyed in Nevada once a year, right? It's this sort of like imagined community made real for a week or so. Um, and this guy builds these um, sort of temples or structures to grief and loss and then burns them. So there are these incredibly beautiful structures and then they, they, he burns them, they go up in flames. So he actually came to Derry uh, a few years ago um, and built this temple to loss and people were invited to bring a memory um, either just to bring it by coming themselves and kind of um, projecting that memory into the space through nothing physical but they also could bring photographs they could bring letters they could bring written stories um, they could bring material objects and it, nobody asked you who you were. Nobody asked you sort of if you were Protestant or Catholic. Um, you were just invited to come to that space and leave your memory. Um, and then after a week, actually um, on the, um, the spring equinox, um, the temple was lit aflame. And it was, and it was, the whole thing was burnt up and burnt down. And so there's also this kind of play on the ephemerality of memory and how we can choose to hold on to things or let go of things. Um, and so I think that was another really interesting way that the city has tried to come to terms with exactly the complexities that you point out, Amanda. And Monica, we have a couple of questions that came through the chat. Um, the first one is, uh, when I visited Derry five years ago, I stopped into Sandino's pub and the Bogside Museum with the Troubles mural. I was struck by the connections between liberation movements all over the world and the Irish Republicans in the North. Do you have comments and thoughts? And that's from Michelle SM. And then Carol Cohn also asks, can you tell me about the song you played at the beginning? I first heard it when I was in Northern Ireland around 1975 and found it quite poignant. So I, I'll start with that one for Carol. The song is called The Town I Loved So Well. It's by Phil Coulter, C-O-U. I'll actually write it in the chat. Um, you can Google it and you can find it. And it's a song written by dairyman Phil Coulter um, about his youth in the city before the troubles and how he returns to the city and um, kind of finds it this, you know, like that up, up apocalyptic burning place that I talked about. So let me just type that in. And Michelle Sandino's was one of my favorite pubs. I spent a lot of time there. And I, I know I remember walking in and seeing this huge image of Che Guevara and just being like, what the hell? Um, so I think that Irish Republicans particularly, but also nationalists in general, saw themselves as part of a larger global anti-colonial 
um, movement, right, and have always sided with and found common cause um, with others, other oppressed people who were looking to attain either um, a, a kind of um, a nationalist independence or agency uh, or um, some other form of liberation. And I mean, this dates back to sort of Dan O'Connell and Frederick Douglass hanging out with each other in the 19th century and O'Connell and Douglass sharing common cause around what they saw as a common sort of struggle against oppression. Um, and so, you know, to this day, um, Irish nationalists and Republicans will certainly see the conflict between Israel and Palestine through that sort of lens and will identify with the Palestinian cause. Um, in Derry, there were always people from the Basque country um, of, of Spain, the Basque region of Spain, hanging out in Derry. There were a lot of connections um, and exchanges between those two areas. In the Republican movement, it gets a little bit more complicated and a little bit sketchier. Certainly, there, were, there are histories of the IRA um, being involved in the movement and trade and sale of arms with um, guerrilla organizations and anti-colonial groups um, it, around the world. And so that's a, that's a really big topic and one that I'm not so um, well versed in. But I think that from an Irish nationalist perspective in Northern Ireland, not only do they identify um, with a variety of solidarity movements of oppressed or marginalized groups seeking uh, a kind of national um, identity that is denied to them either at the ballot box or through other um, means. Um, but there's a longer history amongst the Irish themselves of sort of seeing themselves as, um, as those who, uh, who are the, the Davids against the Goliaths, right? Who fight um, whether or not they're outnumbered, who believe in um, freedom and liberty and justice uh, for all. No, just kidding. Um, and so you, you see that certainly in nationalist dairy and also um, in the Republican movement. So we had uh, a couple more questions trickling through the chat. So I'll do them for you one at a time, but know that there's at least three that have come in. Um, the first one is from Gerald Costello. Do you see the Irish language as a means to get the disparate communities together? It's funny, I had a conversation with my friend Bryony, who was raised in Belfast, she's a Protestant of Presbyterian um, background. Um, and she, her husband, um, also originally from Northern Ireland, but his parents left at the early, the beginning of the troubles and moved to New Zealand. And he only came back in the nineties after, like around the time I arrived there. Um, and they were talking about sending their boys to a Geltec school, right? A, a school that would be where everything would be taught um, as Gaelica in Irish. And they, it just was sort of a bridge too far. And they're kind of the most, um, out there, experimental, willing to change and try new things of um, the, the Protestants that I'm friends with. And so I'm not sure that the Irish language um, can ever be seen as something to bring people together. My friend Madeline talks about how when she was growing up, Irish was called the shit language. And it was called the shit language because a lot of people from Donegal who spoke Irish at home and spoke Irish as their first language went to London um, and a lot of them got involved because they knew people. They got involved sort of digging um, and building sewer systems. And so they spoke Irish and they were like literally sort of shoveling shit. And so the Irish became known as the shit language and it was something to be ashamed of. If you spoke Irish, it was, it was not something to be proud of. That has changed so much. And the Irish language is something to be proud of. Um, there's a real debate, you know, after the peace agreement, there is a push for something called parity of esteem. 
So let's treat both communities equally in every single aspect. So a lot of funding was put into um, Irish street names and Irish language education. But at the same time, there's something called Ulster Scots. And Ulster Scots might be considered a dialect. It's not a separate language, but it does have a long history. And if you heard someone speaking in Ulster Scots, especially if you weren't from Northern Ireland and you weren't used to kind of some of those terms that have made their way into standard like regular spoken English, you might think it's a foreign language, right? It does sound really different. Um, and so there's been an effort to sort of formalize Ulster Scots and that has um, kind of disappeared over the last 20 years. So language certainly is an issue um, but I would still say that spoken Irish people living in Irish and living through Irish is still um, very, very much a minority, particularly in the North. There's a community in um, County Armagh, which has always been a Gaeltech community. Um, and there are still families that educate in Irish and speak Irish at home. Um, but I would say it's like it's a it's really hard to keep the language alive. I think pop culture is the way that you bring communities together. You know, I think it's like nobody cares if you're a Catholic or Protestant when you're at a club. Nobody cares. You know, like it's I mean, I also honestly see this culture towards um, you know, moving away from club sports. All these things that built community were really, really shitty for community relationships. Right. So clubs in a strong church community, those were things that like bolstered single identities. But now you go to the gym and it doesn't matter if the person who's on your um, what's it called? Anyway, I can't think of it. But if someone you're working out with um, is Protestant or Catholic, it just it couldn't matter at all. Right. Um, so these much more sort of secular spaces that are also cultural spaces, um, they, I think, become the ground for a more inclusive and pluralistic, you know, society that we're really familiar with, right? You might be Polish, you might, you know, you might make Wumpkies, but that doesn't, like, change the way you see the world, right? Or maybe it does, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Margo, they're pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm seeing three more questions. So the next question is from David C. Are these memories a type of fiction? I think all memories are a type of fiction in the sense that memory is creative. Every time, a single time you remember, you are not digging into a filing cabinet in your brain. Everything is not set up in there for you to just pluck it out and present it to some other part of your head, right? Memory, remembering is a creative process. Um, and so I think that you might call it a fiction um, if you consider a fiction to be an act of imagination. But a fiction is not grounded in a reality or a perspective that's built on a reality. So while I would say that memories can be wrong, they often reflect a perspective of the world that's pretty true to what's happening, right? The, the memory could be wrong, but the world that you remember could really be, could be true. And I also think like, I mean, we are human beings and we wanna be the stars of our own movies. We want to be the heroes of our own stories. It is human nature to downplay the events in our past that we feel embarrassed about or sh ashamed of. And it's human nature to highlight and amplify the experiences that feed into and corroborate with who we think we are, right? And I think that's why we have friends. That's why we have family. That's why we have community, because I think in a lot of times they can remind us um, of the ways in which uh, we might be getting it right and the ways in which we might be getting it wrong. Um, but I, I, I like to think about, I, I love thinking about memory. I, I enjoy it probably more than 
almost anything, especially in the sort of academic or literary realm. Um, and I'm fascinated by the fact that we can um, employ memory uh, to give us strength and heart. Um, and I'm also fascinated by the ways that you can change memories, especially when the past is divisive and, and, and full of conflict. Um, so yeah, don't quote me on that when I'm complaining to you about my family. All right, so the next question from DD. In 1998, I remember Derry Curbstones painted Loyalist red, white, and blue, where I would not have been advised to park with my Dublin plates as my car would have become a target for vandalism. How much has that changed? Um, so curb painting today is almost entirely relegated to um, public housing estates. And in the early 2000s, um, Northern Ireland, like a lot of the UK, started a scheme whereby people could buy their public housing units. And a lot of them are duplexes, right? Some of them are flats, they're apartments, but a lot of them are duplexes with their own entrance. So you may have been living in your unit you know, as a renter, and it was subsidized, but it, you know, starting in the 2000s, it became much easier um, to work towards buying your units. And once that started to happen, I did see something of a drop off of um, curb painting. They're still like they're, the curbs are still painted in unionist communities. They're painted red, white, and blue, like the Union Jack. In nationalist communities, they're painted green, white, and orange, um, like the Irish tricolor. And I, I think that now what you might see is that the the curbs get touched up around the seasons of commemorations. So for Protestants, that's July and August. It's the 12th of July, which commemorates the Battle of the Boyne, and the 12th of August, which commemorates the Siege of Derry. And so in, in kind of um, anticipation of those events, you might see the curbs sort of touched up. But if you go in February, they might seem a little bit more faded. And, you know, it rains all the time in Northern Ireland, and it's a dairy is on um, the River Foyle, which feeds into uh, the ocean. And so it's got, it's a, there's a lot of salt in the air. Um, so the paint really can, can chip away and fade really, really quickly, much more quickly than if you were to say paint a house, right? Dairy's houses are like almost always um, this sort of spackled stuff um, like almost stucco-y because, you know, if you painted it, you'd be painting it every year. So I, I think that the curbs are, um, are still painted, but I do think it has, um, it has changed. I also think like when I was first going to Derry and I found myself in a housing estate where everything was painted red, white, and blue, and there were big murals of King Billy on the walls, I might possibly feel threatened as an Irish American who is assumed because of an Irish American identity to be um, kind of to side with the nationalists and the Catholics, right? Um, my husband and I had Dublin plates on our rental car last year and we were picking up someone in Belfast and trying to drive to Bangor and we got lost and we ended up on Sandy Row, which if you know Belfast, you know is a, a, a kind of famous or infamous um, Protestant working class neighborhood. And I started freaking out. I was like, oh my God, we've got Dublin plates, we're gonna die. Um, and he was like, nobody cares. I was driving, so I could just panic while driving, but he could actually look around and look out the window. And he was like, literally no one is paying us any attention. So that sense of the stakes being high and the, um, the demarcations of identity, of sectarian identity in the landscape really being a message or a warning, you belong or you don't belong, um, has, has mellowed. I, I think that there are moments of resurgence and maybe there are certain places um, where it has not faded or mellowed. Um, but 
you know, I think the, the reality is that people have a lot of things to worry about. And until we know what's going to happen with Brexit and with the, the prospect of a hard border in Northern Ireland again, um, you know, we can still live in this moment that it's a really a post-conflict society where folks are moving ever and ever more towards understanding and kind of a, a, a shared understanding about a way to live with differences. Great. So the last question that I'm seeing is, are the retreats you mentioned similar to the Truth and Reconciliation Councils in South Africa and elsewhere? In the U.S., the recognition of injustice among the Wabanaki in Maine. Yeah, you know, I was, that's a really great question. I was thinking about Native Americans when I was talking about sort of Holyoke and Meriden and just thinking like, you know, what would it be? I don't even, I don't even know um, the Native term for Holyoke, but I'm sure there was a settlement there. Um, what would it be if like the, the population was still majority Native American and they went around still like speaking in their first language and calling the city according to its first language and kind of living according to the values um, of their society. And like when you think about the timing, it's not actually like that crazy, right, to imagine that world. Um, the peace and reconciliation movement, in, the truth and reconciliation movement in South Africa um, was proposed as an option and it was explored in Northern Ireland. Um, those, those tribunals were public, right? And there, I, I think that people really liked the idea that nobody would be held sort of accountable by the law for the things that they had done um, and for the, the, um, the damage that they had done to other people. Um, and so I know that they wanted to sort of think about something like that. And there was an organization that spent four years listening to people holding open um, evenings where folks could gather and sort of share their thoughts and their experiences. Um, ultimately, the issue of reparations um, was kind of like a huge sort of sticking point. There also, um, it became really clear that for a lot of Protestant Unionists, um, they saw the conflict in Northern Ireland as a collapse of law and order. They saw nationalists and Republicans um, as people who were flouting the, the system, right? And who, who were just willfully um, breaking the, the social contract. Whereas for Catholic nationalists and for Republicans, they were very, very clear that they were fighting in a civil war. And even though they didn't have a formalized army like the British army that lived on the streets of Northern Ireland from 1969 until 2008, they had their army, right? Their army may have been considered a terrorist organization, but it was a paramilitary force that stood up against the British army. And that's, they saw it as a civil war. So when you have one population that sees it as a bunch of crimes and a bunch of people behaving badly and breaking the law, and you see the other side as saying, we're fighting in a civil war, and this is what happens in war. Um, it was really, really hard to figure out how to productively um, enter into that paradigm sort of construct. Like the paradigms were so different. Um, I think ultimately it was sort of unsuccessful. Like there was a lot of people got what was considered to be a relatively small amount of money if they could prove that they had been injured and everybody got really upset, right? Protestants got upset, especially if they were victims, um, family members of those who died by um, IRA violence, um, hardcore Protestants, they were very upset that Catholics um, whose kind of claim to injury uh, seemed to them to be um, illegitimate when they got money 
And at the same time, sort of everybody thought that trying to put a price on injury, loss, heartbreak, grief, um, a future that sort of may have fallen apart in front of your eyes was just crazy, right? And we did it here with 9-11 um, and I think everybody who remembers that remembers just how weird that was, um, where Ken Feinberg was sitting in an office trying to determine, you know, how much your family should get as compensation based upon, you know, how much money you earned that year in 2001 and what the perspectives were for you to, for your earning potential over your lifetime. Like reparations are really complicated. Um, and so I think Northern Ireland sort of decided that that wasn't the route to take. Great, thank you so much.